Et nous allons ici d'être. Yeah, and we have a morning tea there you know, for, uh, for all of you. 
And um, today we like to bless her uh, by prayer. And I believe that the best blessing we can give to people is not material, but prayer. Because by prayer, in faith, uh, all the blessings will come. And that's what I believe and GTC believe. So today I believe the best person or the most suitable person to bless her, apart from her family members, would be Angie. The Angie right, is a mom herself, and she knows uh, you know, how to bless children, you know, isn't it? And also I like her too. And also she knows uh, you know Deborah well enough, you know, to give her the best blessing. And after that, Deborah is going to bless us back by doing the Bible reading today before the uh, Apostle is going to deliver God's words. Can the pastors and the elders come up and lay hands on her as she comes up? Pastors and elders, thank you. The child? In the time that Nona to GTC, she's a delightful, warm-hearted young lady. And she's always ready to have a welcoming, kind, and encouraging word. And she's always sensitive to other people's need. And I realized that when she puts her mind, when she puts her mind to something, she will, she will do it. She will do it. She will give her best. So we're going to bless her. That the church, can you all stand up? <laughs> and the church just stretch forth your hand towards Deborah and bless her, because she's going to leave GTC to, um, but she's got a wonderful life ahead. Okay, but we're going to miss her. So let us bless her with this prayer. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for Deborah, your precious daughter. We just lift her up to you now. And we pray for a protection, a hedge of protection around her in a travel to Canada. That you will be a wall of fire around her. That you will bring her safely there without disruption nor problems. Thank you, Father, that Deborah dwells in the secret place of the Most High and abides in the shadow of the Almighty. You and she has made you her refuge and fortress. No evil, no harm, no plague, no calamity shall befall her. You shall give your angels charge over her to keep her in all her ways. And Lord, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you bless Deborah's, Deborah in her marriage to this young man in Canada, that she would be your wife of noble character, as in Proverbs 31 that the worth is far more than rubies, and the heart of a husband a safely trusts her, and she does him good all the days of her life. As Boaz knows of Ruth, as a virtuous woman, may her husband and his family and friends also know her as a godly woman who fears the Lord. May her husband honor her, delight in her, and love her, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Father, bless their marriage. May their marriage relationship deepen in love and unity as they both submit to you and to one another. Lord, may you strengthen their covenant marriage union with a God of three strands that cannot be broken. And Lord, now we just want to dedicate Deborah to you because she is your child, washed, redeemed, sanctified by the precious blood of Jesus. She is your obedient and faithful servant, Lord Jesus. You have given her talents and qualities. According to the grace you have given her, may Deborah continue to do her best and to make use of the gifts that you have given her, that her light will so shine before men to the honour and glory of our Father in heaven and our Lord Jesus Christ, that whatever she does in word or deed, she will do everything in the name of our Lord Jesus 
so that she will be a mighty blessing wherever she is. She is a workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Thank you, Lord. Even as her name is Deborah. Hallelujah. May she have the leader heart like Deborah of the Bible and be willing and humble and guide others to Jesus in the wisdom and the love of the Lord. May you, O Lord, go with her, be with her in all her endeavors. And Father, we lastly pray this. May you bless Deborah and keep her. May you shine your face upon her and be gracious to her. And may the Lord lift up your countenance, Father, upon her and give her peace. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Speak through me, Lord, 
and that your word will be like a double-edged sword that pierces our hearts, Lord, and liberates us, Lord God, to the freedom that you have given us, Lord. So Holy Spirit, may you be in this place, Lord, and may you speak to each and every one of us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, like many of you, I was disappointed to hear the news that we were unsuccessful in purchasing that property in 27 Iron Street. Our church has been looking for a more suitable venue for a bit over eight years already. And I have to say that that property in Iron Street was probably the best one that we've come across so far, which is why we went above and beyond to make a competitive bid. But unfortunately, we fell short. But that's okay. God is sovereign and He knows what is best for our church. So let us use this disappointment to motivate ourselves to work harder in building this church so that the next time an opportunity arises, we will be in a better position. Amen? Amen. I don't know about you, but I long for the day when our church can have an exodus of our own out of this place, this uh, hall, into a more suitable venue. Because even though we thank God for this hall, we know that we cannot stay here indefinitely if we want this church to grow. Because as you can see, we don't have any rooms or space to do any Sunday school, which means that we cannot cater for young families with their children. And if you don't have any young families and children coming, it's very hard to grow a church. And to be very honest with you, there are many times where I feel like the odds are stacked against us as a church. And that there are just so many shackles holding us down as a church hindering us to be able to do what we really want to do for the Lord. I don't know if you feel that way. And I long for the day when these shackles can be broken and that we can be free to fulfill the vision God has given us and to do what God has called us to do. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt oppressed by your circumstances? Have you ever wished that you could get out of the place that you were in? What chains have been holding you in bondage? Preventing you from enjoying the free and abundant life that God wants you to have? For some of you, it may be bondage to fear and anxiety. For some of you, it may be bondage to financial hardship. For some of you, it may be bondage to an addictive behavior or a bad character trait that is ruining all your relationships. Some of you may be in a very, very bad place right now. And you also need an exodus of your own. You need God's deliverance. Well, the book of Exodus is all about deliverance. Amen. It tells the story of how God delivered his people out of the land of bondage to the land of freedom, Amen. to the land of promise. These rights have been slain in Egypt for over 400 years. And Pharaoh refused to let them go. And so God sent ten devastating plagues upon Egypt to force Pharaoh's hand. Last week we looked at the tenth plague where God struck down the firstborn of every Egyptian household. The first of the Israelites, however, were spared from death because they had painted the doorposts of their homes with blood and the blood of the land. And when God saw the blood on the doorpost, it was a sign to him that death had already been paid in that house, and so he did not enter that house. 
Now, what this tells us is that these plays were supernatural, not natural. They were nothing like COVID-19, okay? If the Israelites were also affected by these plays without any discrimination, then okay, you can say that they were natural events. But the fact that it was only the Egyptians who were affected tells us that this was a supernatural event. This was God's judgment against Egypt specifically for their idolatry. And the Egyptians knew that. In verses 31 to 32, we see that Pharaoh summoned Moses to say, Up, leave my people, you and the Israelites. Go, worship the Lord as you have requested. The same Pharaoh that kept hardening his heart against God, refusing to let the Israelites go, now literally begs Moses to take his people out of his country. Because he understood that if he kept resisting God, all of Egypt would be destroyed by God. It, it's quite a remarkable about faith from someone who believed himself to be a God, isn't it? And I really, really love what he said at the very end. And also bless me. <laughs> you know, finally, Pharaoh recognizes God to be greater than him. Amen. And he is even willing to humble himself before God to ask for God's blessing. Amen. And this fear of God descended upon all of Egypt. In verse 33, the Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country. Or otherwise, they said, we will all die. Isn't it ironic? Before, it was the Israelites who feared the Egyptians. But now, it is the other way around. It is the Egyptians who fear the Israelites because they recognize that God was with them. They feared the Israelites so much that when the Israelites asked the Egyptians for articles of silver, gold, and for clothing, the Lord made the Egyptians favorably disposed towards the people and gave them what they asked for. So they plundered the Egyptian. Imagine that, being able to just go into someone's house and just ask for anything and they'll just give it to you. Oh, can I have your Rolex? Oh, here you go, sure, have it, please. Can I have your you know, diamond ring? All right, sure, here you go, take it. You know, the, the Israelites literally went from rags to riches in one night. Is God not a mighty deliverer, church? Yes. yes. When God delivers, He delivers in style. Amen? Amen. Amen? No matter how hopeless your situation may be, or how powerful the forces against you may be, God is able to deliver you. Amen. Because He is greater. He is the one and only true God. Lord over all. Whatever chains may be keeping you in bondage, God is able to set you free. Amen. But for God to deliver, deliver you, you must do your part. What do you need to do to experience God's deliverance? Well, from the story of Exodus, we see that, that God delivered the Israelites because they did four things. Four things. First, they prayed to God. They prayed. I won't talk much on this point because we already covered this when we look at Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2, verse 23 and 24 tells us, the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. When did God deliver the Israelites out of Egypt? When they began to pray. God didn't deliver the Israelites because their suffering had become too great. He delivered them because they began to pray. And if you want to experience God's deliverance, the first step must always be prayer. Amen. 
Cry out to God for mercy, because God always listens to prayer. In Psalm chapter thirty-four, verse seventeen, David says, "The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them; He delivers them from all their trouble." But when you pray, you must be prepared to wait, and that's the second thing. That we must do, we must wait for God's timing. Because most of the time, God does not answer our prayers straight away. He makes us wait. How long were the Israelites slaves in Egypt for? Well, verse forty tells us the length of time the Israelite people lived in Egypt was four hundred and thirty years. Four hundred and thirteen years. That's a long, long time. That's even longer than how long Australia has been around as a nation for. How many of you would be willing to wait four hundred and thirty years for God's deliverance? But if you read through the Bible, there is there has always been a waiting period before God delivers His people. Abraham, for example, had to wait till he was one hundred years old before God gave him a child. Joseph had to、uh, was sold off as a slave by his brothers and spent many years in prison before God elevated him to the position of prime minister of Egypt. David, after he was anointed by the prophet Samuel as the next king. Of Israel had to wait ten to twenty years before he finally became king of Israel, and of course, the world had to wait thousands of years before the Messiah came. And for us, for living in New Testament times, Jesus has already told us that we will need to wait an unspecified period of time before Jesus returns to bring us into God's kingdom. Before God delivers us, we need to wait for His timing. The problem is, we don't like to wait, isn't it? When problems arise, we want to want these problems to be solved immediately. We want God to heal now or to deliver us straight away, isn't it? And when God doesn't act according to our timing, we we rush ahead of Him. We fret and we we try to solve it ourselves. That's what Moses did, wasn't it? He rushed ahead of God and tried to deliver the Israelites by force. And look how that ended up for him: forty years of exile in the wilderness. That's what King Saul did when the prophet Samuel was late in turning up. Before the battle against the Philistines, he went ahead and offered sacrifices to the Lord without Samuel because he could see that his troops were losing morale, and as a result, God took away his throne. That is what happens when you rush ahead of God. You end up making matters worse. If you want to experience God's deliverance, you must be prepared to wait for God's timing. Not our timing, but His timing. Sometimes God's timing may not be what we would like. Sometimes God's timing may seem to be taking way too long. But that's because God's sense of time is different to ours. Two Peter chapter three verse eight says, "But do not forget this one thing, dear friends: with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. For the Israelites." Four hundred and thirty years may have seemed like a long time, but in God's time, this is just a matter of seconds. 
I have no doubt that during that 400 years of slavery, the Israelites had asked many times, Lord, where are you? Why are you taking so long? I have no doubt that many of them have begun to believe that God had abandoned them. But God actually had a good purpose behind all that waiting. Genesis chapter 46 tells us that when Jacob and his sons went to Egypt, there was only 70 of them, not counting the wives. 430 years on, how many Israelites are there in Egypt? Verse 37 tells us there were 600,000 men who were able to fight. And this doesn't include the women and the children. So if you count everyone, there was probably between 2 to 3 million Israelites in Egypt. Egypt was essentially a giant incubator. You had all the right conditions, the right climate, the most fertile land in all the Mediterranean for the Israelites to multiply and prosper. If they had stayed in Canaan, which was a very dry place, they probably would not have been able to multiply as quickly as they did in Egypt. And by the time Israel left Egypt, they had grown to a population size that was big enough to conquer the land of Canaan. Can you see? God's timing is always the best. His ways are always higher than our ways. And when God asks us to wait, He must have a good purpose behind it. It's just that we often don't see it until much later when we look back on our lives. I don't know why God did not allow us to purchase that property in Iron Street. But it must be that the right timing has not come for us as a church yet, for us to move into a bigger place. So let us wait for his timing. Amen? Amen. Now, that doesn't mean that during this waiting period, we just do nothing at all, okay? And that leads us to the third thing that the Israelites did. They got ready for God's deliverance. Last week, if you can remember, when we look at God's instructions for the Passover, the Israelites were told to roast the meat over the fire instead of boiling it. Their bread had to be made without any yeast in it, and they had to eat with their clothes tucked into their belts, the sandals already on their feet, and the staff on one hand. Not the most comfortable way of eating. Why did God give these instructions? Well, because the Israelites had to be ready to leave Egypt at any moment. And these instructions were given so that the Israelites could prepare and eat their meals in the fastest way possible. By roasting the meal with the fire instead of boiling it, it meant that they didn't have to wait for the water to boil first in the pot, and it spared them the trouble of having to clean up the pot and the utensils afterwards. By making the bread without any yeast in it, it meant that they didn't have to wait for the dough to rise before it could be baked. And by eat, eating with their clothes tucked into their belts and their sandals already on their feet, it meant that they were ready to leave the moment God gave them the signal. The key thing is, they had to be all ready to go when God's timing came. And that extra hour or so made all the difference because, as we will read later, Pharaoh quickly changed his mind about letting the Israelites go and he pursued after them with his army. And if they had not had all their belongings packed and ready to go, they may have not been able to leave Egypt in time that night. Likewise, if we want to experience God's deliverance, we must 
prepare ourselves, get ourselves ready for it. Otherwise, we may miss out on God's deliverance. Waiting for God's time doesn't mean that we do nothing at all. The waiting period is there for us to prepare ourselves so that when God's timing comes, we will be ready for it. The reason why my dad was able to put in a bid for that church property in Iron Street was because he already had a loan approved beforehand. When, because he already knew that our church was looking for property, so he had all the finances ready. If my dad had only applied for the loan when he found out about the property, I can tell you it would have been too late because when he found out about the property last week, and there wouldn't have been enough time for us to have the loan approved. And for that, I'm very grateful to my dad for the sacrifice he's willing to make for this church. But you know what? Buying a church property cannot come down to just one person church. The whole church has to be behind it. Perhaps, perhaps, the reason why we were not going to buy that uh, property this time was because God knows that our church as a whole is not yet ready for such a move. And if we are truly serious about moving to a bigger venue, we all need to lift up our game in terms of offering, in terms of serving at this church, in terms of training up leaders and bringing people to church. My prayer is that when the next opportunity comes, we will be ready as a church to grab it. Now is the time for us as a church to start getting ready for the place that God has prepared for us. Amen? Amen. And the same goes for everyone here. What do you need to do to prepare yourself so that when God's timing comes, you will be ready? Are there any lessons that God wants you to learn now before He will deliver you? And this begs the question, how do we get ready for God's deliverance? The Israelites did. They obeyed God's instructions. They obeyed God's instructions. Here's something for us to think about. What do you think would have happened if the Israelites did not paint their doorposts with the blood of the Lamb that night? What do you think would have happened if they did not follow God's instructions for the Passover? Most probably, the first one, the Israelites would have also died with the rest of the Egyptians, and they would not have been able to escape Egypt that night. If we want God to deliver us, we must obey His instructions. In verse 35, the Israelites did as Moses instructed. And as a result, they were able to plunder the Egyptians and take their valuables and belongings. If they had gone, oh, I don't know, Moses, I think it's a bit dangerous to just barge into the houses of the Egyptians and ask for their things. They hate our guts already, and what if that incites them to kill all of us? If they had thought like that, they would have missed out on God's provision and blessing. This reminds me of a story of a very religious man who was caught in rising floodwaters. So he climbed up to the top of his house and prayed for God to deliver him. A neighbor soon came by on a canoe and said, the waters will be above the house soon. Hop into our boat and we'll paddle you to safety. But the religious man said, no thanks. I've prayed to God and I trust 
He will rescue me. Next, a police boat comes by and says, Sir, there's not much time left. The water will be above your house soon. Hop into our boat and we'll take you to safety. No thanks, the richest man said. I pray to God and I trust he will step, uh, rescue me. Well, a little while later, a rescue helicopter hovers overhead, lets down a ladder and says, Sir, you really, really need to leave now. The water is just about to go over your house. Climb up the ladder and we'll fly you to safety. But once again, the religious man says, No thanks. I pray to God and I trust God will rescue me. Well, all that time the floodwaters were rising and rising and rising until it covered the whole house and that man drowned. And when he arrived into heaven, he demanded an audience with God. God, I pray for you to save me. Why didn't you do anything? And God replies, I know you did, my dear child. I sent you a canoe, a boat, and a helicopter, and you wouldn't get in. What else could I do? <laughs> you see, you can pray all you want. You can wait all you want. You can get yourself all ready for God's deliverance. But if you don't get into the boat, if you don't obey God's instructions, you can't blame God for not delivering you. What do I know? How do I know what God's instructions are? You may ask. Well, they are all here in this book. The Bible is God's word. It is God's manual on how we should live and how and what we should do in different situations. Every situation and every problem that you encounter in life, God has something to say about it here in this book. If let's say you have a problem with your finances, well, the Bible has instructions on how you can better manage your finances. If you struggle with fear and anxiety, the Bible has instructions on how you can be set free from anxiety. If you have marital problems, the Bible has instructions on how you can foster a healthy marriage. If you're struggling with a particular addiction or sin, the Bible has instructions on how you can be set free. Whatever you are in bondage to, God has instructions on how you can be set free from it here in this book. So let me ask you, how often are you reading your Bible? And more importantly, are you doing what it says? Are you obeying God's instructions? Because if you're not obeying God's instructions, you can't blame God if He doesn't deliver you. If you did obey God's instructions, you would put your faith in Jesus Christ. Because all these instructions, they all point to the same person. Who is that person? Jesus Christ. That's right. Moses is a foreshadow of Jesus Christ. In the same way God sent Moses to deliver the Israelites out of bondage, God sent Jesus to deliver us from bondage. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. The Exodus 
is a metaphor of what Christ did for us at the cross. Romans chapter 6 tells us that the reason why we are so messed up and why our world is so messed up is because we are all in bondage to sin. We are all slaves to sin. Sin has a power over us. And that's the reason why we find it so hard to control our tempers, control our tongues, control our selfish impulses. And all the problems that we see in this world can all be traced back to sin. All the evil, injustice, violence, conflict, greed, they all find their roots in sin. But what did Christ do for us at the cross? He broke the power of sin and set us free. Amen? Amen. He destroyed the works of the devil. He conquered the power of death so that all those who believe in him shall not die but have eternal life. Jesus is the saviour of the world. Amen. He is the one God has sent to deliver you from bondage. In Acts chapter 4 verse 12, this is what led to a crippling disability for many years. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Do you need God's deliverance today? What bondages in your life do you need to be set free from today? Are you oppressed by your circumstances and in need of an exodus of your own? Well, pray to God. Wait for His timing. Do what is necessary to get ready and obey God's instructions. Put your faith in Jesus Christ and He will surely deliver you in His timing. Well, as I get the musicians to come up, if you need God's deliverance today, I invite you to come up as we sing the closing song today and our elders and pastors can pray for you. I don't know what chains are binding you to the, uh, right at this moment. You know, some of you, it might be a family situation. Some of you, it may be illness. Some of you, it may be finances. Some of you, it may be the lousy job that you were stuck in. I don't know. But what I do know is that whatever it is, God can set you free. Amen. He can deliver you. He can give you an exodus. You just have to put your faith in Jesus Christ. So if you would like to put your faith in Jesus Christ today, I invite you to come forward. If you need prayer, we can pray for you as a church. So let us now stand and sing our closing song. And if any of you need prayer today, feel free to come up.